The policemen that were brought to where they claimed a project was taking place just pounced on people. I came out of my car because I was covering the event and told them to stop beating people and they pounced on me to and broke my nose. This was uh, carried out by a mobile police officer who led about five vehicles loaded with, about seven vehicles loaded with mobile policemen, well armed. It was an attempt to Tell him to stop brutalizing Nigerians in view of NSAS and the position of uh, this country right now on police brutality. They pounced on me to broke my nose. When they took me to the Abotio, I discovered that the Nigerian government had not in their SAS. They mobilized SAS officers to also beat us up and force us into detention at Abotio, uh, one of the notorious uh, SAS detentions where we've been since uh, Friday. We were also instructed to ensure that we have adequate medical treatment. Uh, so they said they should send us to Kuji prison for the next 24 hours. Is no prison. Is it correctional? Yeah. Well, I don't agree that it's correctional. So. <laughs> for them. Revolution! Nah. Revolution! Nah. Wait, wait. They, 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 they were being charged for criminal conspiracy, uh, unlawful assembly, and then inciting public disturbance to. Uh, to uh, to the extent that uh, somebody is calling that there should be a change of government uh, by val by by other by other means other than the constitutional uh, uh, they approve the constitutional uh, uh, processes. Why were the charges just today? Why were the charges just and today? Well, how did you know when it was? A, it is a, an FIR. This is not charge. You must know the difference between a charge and an FIR. This first information report. It could be oral, but we made we made sure that we reduce the we reduce it into writing. In court, you told the, yes. the, your worship that they are still being investigated. If they are still being investigated, why did you file this FIR? Well, FIR, you see, the constitutional provision is that if you take them to the court, any time the court, if they see any court at all that is sitting within the purview of their time of detention, their pleas were taken today. They indeed pleaded not guilty to the charges. Uh, we wanted to move the court to grant them bail on several cognizance, but uh, the court felt it would be more appropriate for us to file a formal motion for bail. Uh, the court has instructed, uh, the court has uh, used uh, its discretion in instructing that we file a formal application for bail, which this is more very, very important once in a lifetime uh, meeting of what I believe is the beginning in a series of good things to come. Um, I have in front of me here <laughs> two gentlemen that if you do not know them, you should um, <coughs> go and reset your whole system. Uh, on my right is the leader of the um, IPOB, the independent, indigenous. the indigenous, sorry, it's the indigenous, <laughs> people, <laughs> indigenous people of uh, Biafra fighting for <coughs> independence. Mazi Nandikam, the Almighty of Ibo Land. Uh, thank you very much. You're thank welcome. You. And on my left is uh, someone who is uh, very personal to me. He is the, the founder and the convener of the Take It Back movement. He is also the, the founder of the Sahara Reporters. Yeah, if you don't know Sahara Reporters again, you should reset your system. <laughs> he is the person of uh, He's also the former uh, presidential candidate of the African Action Congress in the last uh, election in Nigeria. He's uh, Omoyele Shore. 
Thank you so much for, for coming. Thank you. Now, this is so important because these two people here, in my opinion, represent the future of our country, Nigeria, and in a way, the future of Africa. Because I've always believed that if Nigeria gets it right, the rest of Africa will get it right. The constituencies that these two people represent, the kind of inertia, the kind of energy that is resting within the constituencies that these people represent, when this energy is tapped, Nigeria will never become the same thing ever. So I'd like to welcome you people to this uh, interview. You guys had uh, a meeting, a one-on-one -on -one meeting, uh, a private meeting, and what we would want, it was off camera. So the reason why we're doing this is for us to be able to, uh, if you permit us, <laughs> to share what is the content of that uh, personal meeting that you guys, you guys had. First of all, so, Omoye uh, Shore, uh, you had um, initiated this meeting, and I want to know what was your reason for wanting this meeting to happen. Well, I, I, as you mentioned, I ran as president in Nigeria in the last election, and part of the reason I ran was to see Nigeria completely uh, for what it is. And uh, after the exercise was concluded, uh, and a winner was uh, selected, uh, I've seen Nigeria completely for what it is again, the second time. But before now, I've been trying to reach actually magic even before the other. It happened to be, it happened at our station. Sarah TV was one of the first interviews he had. I had some of the, you know, wireless coverage worldwide where he made proclamations that are true to today. And, uh, but I couldn't win the election. And I decided that when I heard it was a mistake that we should meet, that the conversation that will discuss the humanity around the area known as Nigeria today must start now and we must start having organic uh, connections and collaboration. I came out of that election knowing fully well that without some serious action, uh, the place where the factor as Nigeria today will become history uh, pretty soon. And it will become history by virtue of its own internal contradictions. And during the election, I've known, as Harden said, that there are a lot of things that are wrong uh, with Nigeria. I mentioned the fact that the Constitution is a fraudulent document. In fact, I said it at a debate that Nigeria was set up as a business, and until it becomes a nation, uh, we're deceiving ourselves. So, what you have said earlier is the energy that's in the room here today, but I think beyond that is also history uh, that is being made here today. That young people who have ideas, young people who have conviction, young people who are willing to make sacrifices of make sacrifices can meet one on one and have a very honest and truthful conversation. Uh, if you call it a private meeting, it means that we cannot disclose <laughs> some of the conversations we have. <laughs> so, uh, so we've had a private meeting, and it's going to be one of the series of meetings that uh, we will be having going forward. Right. And uh, he's uh, very clear, I cannot speak for him, uh, as he's uh, very articulate enough to tell uh, what his uh, position is on matters. But we had a very, very great meeting and we had uh, discussions that opened ourselves. So we opened up ourselves about what we think we need and what should be happening. And like I said, he will tell you uh, what he feels. But, um, Excited. Mm -hmm. right. That's what I can tell. All right. Your viewers. All, All right. right. This meeting. All right. Thank you very much. Masi Nandikano of my DKND. You are known as a very, very tough human being. And uh, when I reached out to your, 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 your people, and they I held my fingers crossed, and they came back to me and said, "You have uh, agreed to meet with Tomoyele Shore." I, I cannot explain why you agreed to meet with him. Why did you agree to actually meet with Omar Shore? 
I agree because um, actually there's a sort of love-hate relationship between <laughs> South Africa and South Africa. Uh, when they give us very favorable coverage, we love them. And when they don't, of course, we um, do the opposite. Okay. I admire his courage and his conviction and what at his age he's managed to accomplish. And I'm running for presidency in the land of the dinosaurs, as I call it, is on its own very remarkable achievement. So I commend him for that. Um, I also agree to this meeting because there are a lot of misconceptions about what we represent, what I represent, in terms of the agitation for Biafra, which I think sometimes is lost in the haze of ethnic interpretation, I would call it. So having a one-to-one -one with him will allow me to clarify my position and that by POV. And more so because most of my rather uh, memorable pronouncements were made on Sahara TV when I was here a few years ago. So it would be an opportunity for us to sort of revisit that, um, nostalgically speaking, of course. Another thing is that um, I needed the West the Yoruba race to understand that IPAB is not against the Yoruba people. I am not against the Yoruba people. Most of my very good friends are Yorubas and very, very close. When I mean good friends, I mean um, very close friends indeed. And most of those that actually fought for me when I was incarcerated were Yoruba people. And they spoke up very eloquently about the injustice being meted out, not just to myself, but to IPAB in its entirety. Prior to the general, we went to his birthday, that was um, last year, and we'll do so. We know that God will keep him, we shall also do so this year. Everybody knows about my affinity to find care and how close we are, and I will find share as well. Uh, what unites us, I believe, is far more greater than what divides us, is being able to rationalize our position within that damnable contraction they call Nigeria. During our conversation, I made it very clear that had Nigeria been put together by Zeke, Awo, and Amadou Bello, I can live with it. But the fact that a white man came across, set up a private limited company, and then from there we became a nation, I find irredeemably insulting. Because I can't do something in Europe. And it would be very foolish of me to allow that to happen in Africa. I also made it very clear that had the conversation being led by Wolisha Inca succeeded or culminated in the Sovereign National Conference, perhaps there could have been some sort of merit in trying to articulate a way out of the malaise that Nigeria is in within the understanding that that very Sovereign National Conference took into consideration the views and aspirations of everybody. Because Nigeria, the way you see it, is not just about the Igbos, the Houses, and the Yorubans. There are other people within as well. Their views and their opinions must also count. But having things the way that we do right now in that part of the world, their voices are being subdued. And it's not fair. I am a freedom fighter. I fight for not just my own freedom, but for the freedom of everybody else. I don't want anybody to suffer. I don't want other African countries to be in poverty while to be Africa grows and flourishes. I want everybody to be fine. And also made it very clear to him that I am prepared to convince Biafrans to make sure that oil and gas found in Biafra land in this present day is distributed to everybody else to do with as they please. If it means handing it over to, to the UN to supervise the sale and disbursement of funds, so be it. I don't want people to think that our agitation for freedom has anything to do with, you know, wealth or economy or the need to exclude other people, not at all. I want to make that categorically. And I also said to him that I have this, I wouldn't say Pan-African, but a West African vision and view. And I want to say what else developed. To the point whereby to have a high-speed red line running from Calabar to maybe, um, um, Banjo, what was you mentioning? 
Dakar. The Dakar is Senegal. We have a wonderful thing to do in the world. We want everybody to be different. The same way it is in this country or in this part of the world. America actually is um, fighting very hard to see that Mexico to an extent is developed. At least to mitigate the influx mm -hmm. of um, yeah. uh, migration into, into, into America. So I have the love and passion for everybody. But it was the way that Nigeria is structured that made it almost impossible to get that very message across. So we're left with no choice. And to because uh, the say charity begins at home. You need to save yourself before you save other people. That's right. That's, That's right. what we're trying to do. That's right. Thank you very much. Mr. Shore, um, you were in Nigeria, you were in the thick of things. You know, one thing that endears me to both of you is that you were there, you left your place of comfort, and you were in Nigeria, and you were in the thick of things, and you went around campaigning, even in the village of uh, the, the, the president, and uh, without security, and uh, you faced all kinds of things. And yet, there is just like Mazen Africano has said, there are some misconceptions out there. One of them is that, why did you take money from uh, Buhari to make sure that he wins this election? First of all, you took money from Buhari in this election. And in the past, APC had paid you to work against uh, Jonathan. So can you explain to us why you did that? Well, let me first correct an impression. According to Mazi, uh, Buhari's village is not the place I went to. Buhari is from Sudan. <laughs> <laughs> so it's so, a record that you say that Buhari is from Sudan. You know, uh, but <laughs> here is uh, the point, and uh, uh, we have to get serious. Remember what we were about. Um, you see, a lot of people have this misconception that if you are courageous enough to confront the system the way we have done, and you know, with fires in connection, coverage and rich you have. You must somehow be taking money from somebody. I mean Mazin himself has been uh, accused yeah, well, I was going to be I was going to be so like, it's it's part of what you do in leadership when you are in the freedom fighting zone. One of the things that people are trying that achieve, you know, uh, what most people don't know is that I am actually of a joy structure. Um a joy poi in Nondo State. So if I were to be close to anybody to take money, it would be from Jonathan. If I really wanted money, and if there was time that Nigeria had money, when we were selling oil at hundred dollars an hour, it was easiest time to take money. So if I didn't take it and I opposed Jonathan, uh, that means there's something to my character. But I don't want to waste time on it. We are here talking about substance, about the future, yes, and not distractions. So exactly. I, I went into the election hoping that people will open their eyes, young people, you know, to turn the tables around the people who are, you know, running all of us down. But that did not happen, you know. But what happened out of it, which I'm excited about, is that people are not sufficiently, a lot of people, are energized, conscientized, and immobilized to understand that elections alone cannot solve Nigeria's problem. You know, that counting of votes or the way they have dominated the process can solve it. But something far greater than that. In fact, I propose a revolution. Should be, and that is what I'm committed to at this point. And that is the reason why I align with anybody. And we've had these conversations in private. I believe that even in the new state of Biafra that's been proposed, Justice must be a key part of what we prevail. Otherwise, you will still find pockets of the oppressors who left Nigeria. Because these oppressors have tasted blood in Nigeria. Suddenly, they cannot be drinking coffee mm. in Biafra. They will try to do the same thing. Uh, but what has not been tried and tested is a system of governance that uplifts the integrity of people on the continent of Africa. And Africa as a whole is suffering with it. I'm a part of Pan-Africanist. Left to me, the entire African continent should be one nation. In fact, what was rejected by Europeans when Kun Nkrumah and the rest were proposing an Africa, one Africa, is what they now using it at the European Union. One currency, mm -hmm. an integration of all European unions, and nation states that are pretty much borderless. 
But when this was proposed by Okuma and the rest, they killed them, they you know, maligned them, they used propaganda to destroy that agenda and did not allow Africa to take over as a continent. And they were instituting and putting in their puppets on the continent of Africa. And I think everybody that is aspiring for a better future cannot afford this kind of puppets in any space. And we've been able to make it very clear, articulate it within the period of a year and a half that I was running for presidency, what Nigeria could achieve if it went the other direction. If it didn't, it's very obvious that Nigeria is heading for a collision, you know. Uh, anybody who says at this time that he's seeing light at the end of the tunnel in Nigeria should be expecting a collision with another oncoming train. That is the conclusion that I came with after the election. And I, I think it's very, very clear. But conversations that are needs to happen at this stage cannot be conversation about you know what they are discussing the beer parlor. We are talking about the lives of millions of people at stake, their dignity, their future, their children, you know, nation states or several nation states that are together in federalism, whichever way we want to go about it. I'm here to discuss how we make it happen and how we make it happen as soon as possible before that's it gets right. too late. That's right, that's right. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a great saying that says uh, small minds discuss uh, people, average minds discuss uh, uh, events, and then great minds discuss ideas. So that's really what you're saying. You're saying we should be done with all this, took money from that person, no. don't take money from that person. What I would advise people, go and read and find the truth about this man and what they have done. Is that based on your direction, I'm not going to waste so much time asking uh, uh, Maz Namdekano uh, <laughs> why he took money, whether he took money from uh, Buhari to tell people to sit at home because I know it's a lie. So he has tried it instead of wasting our time and all those things. Let's not go there. Let me ask you, Mazin um where do you see Nigeria headed now? Because um, with what is happening, I, I, I also don't see uh, light at the end of the tunnel, the, the trajectory that we're going to Tell me where you see things headed and what you have seen happening recently that makes you uh, come to that uh, conclusion. As I said on Sahara TV in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, Nigeria will be worse than Somalia very shortly. And all the signs are there for all to see it will consume everybody. Millions will die. The world will do nothing about it. As long as the oil and gas continues to flow, that is their primary concern, they won't give a damn about what is happening to the poor people in Africa. Haven't you noticed that CNN hasn't covered the killings in, in Nigeria? Fox News, I'm here in the States. They've not covered it at all. Because it is in the interest of certain individuals to make sure that this level of human atrocity happening and being perpetrated by Abba Kiari, and that thing he brought in from Sudan, Jubei. That the Islamization, the Islamization which I repeatedly warned our people about, is about to, to um, I will say I'm focusing on falling there for a few weeks, but about to take firm root, and I see no redemption for Nigeria as an entity. But I see redemption for what I call the middle belt, the east and the west, if they realize and wake up on time to do the needful. And that needful is a complete and utter repudiation of everything to do with Nigeria as presently constituted. We must take our destiny into our own hands if we want to survive because the hurricane has come and everybody will be rendered asunder if we like it or not it doesn't matter how prejudiced we are it doesn't matter how tribalistic we pretend we are not but we are it doesn't matter how narrow-minded we are 
one thing is inescapable. Everybody will suffer the consequences unless something is done and immediately. Now, how do you get down to it? It is an understanding, as um, Zora have just said, that there are certain conversations that need to be had. It doesn't matter if you're against Biafra or not, but you know that together, Middle Belt, West and the East, we can stop this very army of darkness on its track. And I want to assure the Europeans that they have nothing to be afraid of. I think that most of the problem is this. The issue is the Yoruba Muslims. They are the ones that I have difficulties with. The Sultan was in, was it Oshun said, I can't remember where, yesterday, was it two days ago, saying that the kidnapping going on in Yoruba land were being carried out by Yoruba people, which is a blatant lie. Ulufalaya was kidnapped a few months ago. Had those kidnappers been Yorubas, Ulufalaya was in a better position to know that. So we know they are Fulanis. So the allegiance of the Yoruba Muslims to the Sultanate in Sokoto is the problem that we're having. That is the only key problem we're having. Because I know and I believe very firmly that there are some people within the Yoruba um, intelligentsia, by which I put them, of course, when I mean intelligentsia, I don't mean people that read only um, abroad between the 40s and the 60s. Once you can raise that intelligent person. I believe that they are prepared to all, I believe that they understand where we are going to. That Biafra doesn't mean the exclusion of other people. We can have Biafra or Duduwa and the Middle Belt State, and sometime in the future, should our people agree, come together to have a nation as we have in the EU, allow the people to decide in which direction they wish to head to. That's all that we're saying. Anybody thinking otherwise, suggesting otherwise, or discussing otherwise is being disingenuous. You are lying to yourself because what Biafra represents is freedom for everybody, both political, social, cultural, and economic freedom. This is something we want them to understand. And from there, birth will be given to this new consciousness within Africa that will allow us to adequately identify who our enemies are and be able to do something or put something in place on time to make sure that the level of meddling from outside forces is curtailed immensely. Thank you very much. Before I go to my show, you know, you just, uh, I know you've talked a lot in your speeches about, uh, you say, Yoruba pastors, Yoruba pastors. Could you just address that? I want to know whether is it, is it, uh, is it something against Yoruba people as a whole or something against those particular men of God? Is not every man of God because there were a lot of Yoruba pastors that when I went to visit my friend Fanny Kaya the other day when I was released from from my kidnapping ordeal at the hands of the Nigerian government, most of them rang and told me they were praying for me. So I I I don't want to appear as, as if I'm generalizing because I'm not. There are certain doctrines and, and narratives being preached by a section of very influential Yoruba Pentecostal ministers that I find objectionable. When evil is happening, you should be able to rise up from the pulpit and say that this is bad, this evil. That's what I want. When you try to excuse the actions of a dictator, I find your preaching unpalatable and I will speak out against it. Some people accuse him of collecting money from that's one thing about or sometimes I would have listened quite well black people in Africa. How can how could he have taken money from anyone? When he's today speaking against the same person that they claim that he took money from, it doesn't make any sense to any right thinking person. What I'm saying is that if you're a minister of God and you preach the gospel, you should be able to preach whatever you're preaching according to the dictates of the Bible or whichever book that you're reading. When you say you're a servant of Christ or of the cross, and you condone what Abakiyami is doing. Because in essence, Abakiyami is the president of Nigeria anyway. He's the one running the whole show. When you condone what Abakiyami is doing in the name of Buhari through Jubri, then I have a 
Paris is really. Those are the ones that I condemn. As I said before, I have been misreported and misquoted on a few occasions. I believe that everybody will benefit from the industry and ingenuity of the West. I subscribe to that as well. Those driving this wage of enmity between us are those who are benefiting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Amuele Shore, you started the Take It Back movement and then um, it caught fire and then just started, um, it just went all over the place in Nigeria and all over the world and uh, you did a series of uh, town hall meetings. From what you have experienced and the interactions with Nigerians in the last election, project for me where you think Nigeria is headed and what you think is the solution? I think it's simple. Uh, the people who identify as Nigerians today uh, must rise up and put an end to the slavery uh, to which they have been subjected. They must put an end to the burden and the yoke of uh, overlords and, you know, their lords and sometimes uh, you know from both states and non-state actors because they're all working together he mentioned religion uh, he mentioned uh, churches he mentioned uh, you know uh, most, I mean, Muslims you know and all these other lords I, I, I met with them I confronted them during the campaign you know I went to palaces I went to churches and we met the same thing people condoning evil that they claim they don't, they, they, you know, they, are, they are against. Preachers telling us that the only way Nigeria can move forward is to vote Buhari back into power. You know, the traditional rulers who have already uh, collected bribes, who pretended as if they want the country to be a better place, and the next day you see them with their, you know, with their hats uh, or crowns in front of Buhari. So it's, it's I proposed a revolution, you know, and I, I have never denied it. And I was saying it, I said it on the chair uh, during the election that Biafra is a crime of justice. The reason why people are rising up in Biafra is very simple. You cannot kill two million people, you know, not even bury most of them, and then wake up and say the war is over. You know, you continue to oppress the people, you mistreat them, you maltreat them, you don't even apologize, you know, as a starting point. You know, the healing that needed to happen never happened. We just pretended as if nothing happened. Like right? by 1971, when I was born, we just started moving on as if nothing happened. And then we have left a tale of broken, you know, murder and destruction. But I also said it at that time. That the bigger problem is that Nigeria cannot be, you know, including the France, cannot continue to be voting for people who carried out the killings, the ambassadors of this war. The Buhari's, these are the people who physically went to the southeast to carry out the murders we are talking about. You can't keep voting for them, you can't keep excusing them into power and expect for there to be any form of change. And when I said this, Initially, as it is always represented, I was condemned, you know. They said I was looking for attention, you know. Why should I bring out an issue that is dead? And I keep telling, if it's dead, why is it pursuing us? Why is it chasing us in every direction? So, it is that understanding that brought me to the table today, and that's why I feel today is historic. Yeah. You know, we can sit here and speak volumes of words. We have demonstrated that we can speak, we can articulate. We have to demonstrate that we can fight. And it's up to us to decide how we fight. It's not up to the oppressor to decide how we respond. You know, and I will leave it at that because at this point, people should be setting up. You know, when I went home the last time and discussed this in Nigeria, you know, I told the community that we met, I said, you have to start setting up communities of resistance in every corner of Nigeria. If you want the country to be good, if you want anything at all, you know, 
and resistance means different people for I mean different things for different people and in different regions. That's why Master said it, you know. He didn't hide it and he's never hidden it. He knows that we are past certain stages of rational conversations, you know, what rational people think can solve the problem. And you cannot have rational conversations with irrational people. I was one of the people in nineteen ninety two that followed Shirley in car. Femi Fallon, Akar Bashiro, Odessa, Bakuba, and the rest of to try and do an alternative sovereign national conference. We were chased out by police. We were beaten up. Yes. Now, they have done, I think, three other conferences after that. It's because the intention was not to bring about any cohesive organic conversation or solution to the problem. It was just a payoff for some of their retired colleagues who have nothing left in their bank accounts, it didn't achieve any results. So when the people are ready, they will put an end to this. You know, and you can call it whatever name you, you call it, there will be an uprising. Mm -hmm. There's no question about it. My concern is how do we manage the aftermath of the uprising such that it doesn't come back to be a reality like it is in Somalia today. Mm -hmm. All right, um, gentlemen, this is historic, like I said it before, and you record it. Uh, two of you, like I said it before this interview, I am the most blessed out of this interview because these are these are two sides of me. If you know me very well and you follow me, these are two sides of me uh, finally sitting and talking. So it's like when there is a... Uh, cohesion within you when the balance has been struck I find peace you know being in the midst of both of you I want you to finally um, look to uh, uh, speak to a generation especially uh, 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 Nigerians around the world and uh, people of uh, Biafran descent all over the place wherever they'll be watching this this uh, this interaction much later. <clears throat> I want you to please address them, address them passionately because there seems to be a vacuum. I see people running uh, pillar to pole, skelter skelter, back and forth without a seeming direction. However, I see that it seems like the activities of people like you, the activities of people like you, is beginning to yield results. One, one clear example is in the issue uh, involving a pastor recently. I was telling somebody that the reason why people could go and demonstrate is because the level of consciousness has risen. Now people are beginning to see that they can stand up. Before it was not heard of that people would even go and be demonstrating in front of a church. So please, I want you to speak to these people uh, in terms of uh, uh, direction. What they should be doing, and then after that, I'm sure I'll, I'll, show her, I'll really indulge you to also do the same thing, and then we'll round up. Starting from you, Mazen, now, if you could do Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. The situation that we find ourselves in is very dire and desperate. Some of you may not have listened to me in the past, but I'm sure with a passenger echoing what I repeatedly said. <coughs> Excuse me, even on side reporters, that tells you all you need to know that there is imminent danger. Our land will be overrun by these hordes from the north, and nobody will come to our rescue. It will not just affect our people, it will also affect those in the middle belt and it will also affect the Odudua nation as well to the west. There should be a line through which this very army cannot cross, and that line should and must be drawn in the middle belt. If we don't draw that line, if we don't rise up to protect our people, we will all die. What I said before has come to fruition. If we do not resist Nigeria, 
we will all perish in the process. If anybody wants to form a nation, you decide who you build a nation with. A nation is an organic process. The formation of a nation must and will by nature remain an organic process. It is not something that you force on individuals. You are allowed to go to their own mind. That is why Nigeria is fundamentally flawed, and that is why the only remedy is for people to rise up. The time is now, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month, and not next year. Don't take it from me, take it from those that know. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm really sorry. Well, thank you. I would add that uh, not only should we draw a red line where it is necessary geographically, but we must draw a red line in our conscience. Uh, we have suffered enough as a people, and we must reject a continuation of the oppression, the subjugation, uh, subjugation of our people, the destruction of our dignity as human beings. And I am saying, and I'll keep saying it, and I'm sure I'll keep reaching out to you all, that we must all rise in unison. We must rise, and the time to rise, especially for young people, is now. Because if we don't, if we do not organize, we will agonize forever and eventually perish. There's no question about it. We are surrounded at this point by a tsunami. And it doesn't matter how much we scream. Uh, if we don't act and move, we will all be consumed by it. And I've said it, I've seen it, I've been to all of your parts of the country. I've been to Nigerians in all parts of the world. And I've repeated the same thing everywhere I went. That this issue is a social justice issue. And until justice is attained and achieved, we have no way of moving forward. We have come to that conclusion now but the next thing is for all of us to act and that's why i want to thank uh, masses here for the opportunity to have this meeting and we'll continue a series of uh, negotiation and conversation uh, that will make this a reality one day i am hopeful that after this historic meeting another one may happen and one in which we'll declare freedom for all Thank you very much. Thank you, Moira Shore, for accepting to do this interview. Thank you, Madam and the Carl, for accepting. And uh, like they used to do when we were kids, and to, to, to encourage people, I want of you to shake hands. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much. 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 Well, this is Mobier. This is dedicated to the gallant heroes of the Nigerian Biafra War and IPO families all over the world. I remember the Nigerian Biafra War mm -hmm. in the thickness of the Biafra genocide. Hey, one man revived the vanishing hope to life. Ah, uh, let the great Biafra army the fight. And they were singing out. Holy, 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 holy. I'm 
ga tu ti financial tu ko ki kekere li gwe no wa na bi anu nu ro lu mo anye we gi tu ko so e we so ga gi ti ku zun di aga anye bu gi anya ko to gi iya yi toro bu we ro wa ni na kan di we ro bi ojo na kan di ama no ko ti cho oso kwa ka e bu re gbe na ma o we gi ya ge mu mu tu ku obu zi ma do le ku nu ge bu iya yi ma bo jo fo gala Onye si no gaga din do bu pa di Halili geri shi ya o Onye si no gaga din do bu pa bi afra Ili geri shi ya o Anyi bu mu ju bo ki ka bi ama Iya i choro bu me ro ma Anye je ki ma do bo la o ko Onye geri ki be ya bi bi Ma ke be be re u go be re mi Obu po fo no bu ka ni bi ama Kanyi ba wan bo anya da anda Anyi ji si ke ya ki wun be yi Penye ye 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 ye
Yeah. Africa stand up. This is time for Biafra. Yeah. Great soul. Are you ready now? Hey. Obiam na. Ah. Get him. Ana waka. Na buba mo ya Biafra. Hey. Biafra. 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 Hey. Kene fada fada, we are heading to the promised land. So my brother, better follow the ladder. We are friends are going higher. Go there, we're back. We know the standard. The fan now, now we're the monster. We move beyond the hidden sun. Fast in the night, never before us. But we just dey fight for our freedom. Every journey is getting busted, but this suffering must just stop. Nah, I'm not easy. If you arrest me, must free me. Every day we are getting busy. We are friends, I can give my give no peace, no more war. So that we can help the needy. In the land of the wealthy people.